I choose life. I grew up in a humble two bedroom home in North Miami. My younger brother, older sister and I all shared one bedroom. And my younger brother slept on the floor for several years. A couple years after, my parents were able to afford a bunk bed where we could each have a bed to sleep on. My dad was and is still a roofer. He would get up in the early mornings before we got ready to go to school. And he would come back home before sundown. My mom would call us when she heard the pickup truck coming in the back alley. And she would say, kids, your dad's home. We would rush to the backyard to greet him. We didn't care if he was sweaty. We didn't care if his clothes was covered with dried cement. We would go and give him a big hug. And sometimes we got lucky and he had energy to play with us outside and play soccer with us. My mom was a stay at home mom. I would say she was the project manager of the house. She would make sure the house was clean. She would feed us, take us to school, make sure we did extracurricular activities and make sure we did well in school. My parents got married at a very young age and they had us very young. So they were unable to go to college, but they always emphasized us to us at an early age, how important it was to finish high school and get a college degree. They struggled financially. They would make huge sacrifices to give us the basic things that we needed. When I was in grade school, I needed braces, but it was not something that my parents could afford. So I got made fun of a lot. It was at that early age where I had to have a tough skin and ignore people from making fun of me. I often remember going to the red, white, and blue store on West Dixie Highway. My parents would buy their clothes there so that they could have enough money to buy us clothes for the year. We could only buy clothes once a year before school started and had to last us the whole year. So we knew from an early age how important it was to go to school. And I wanted to make my parents proud. So I considered myself to be a good kid in, in grade school. I behaved well, I got good grades, and I also had a passion for art. I used to have a sketch pad. I would take it everywhere with me and I would draw just about anything. I looked forward to having art class at school. And I was also a big tomboy at the time. I used to love playing with boys. My best friend was a boy. His name is Paulo. And we basically played football, soccer, basketball, played video games every day after school. It was through the love of art that, and the admiration I had for my dad working in construction that I, was, I got interested in architecture. And it was at the very early age of 10 that I knew that I wanted to be an architect. And that I wanted to be able to draw floor plans and be able to build a house one day. My parents made really big sacrifices for us to go to a small private school when I was in seventh grade. But unfortunately, my dad's work slowed down and he got worried that he could no longer provide us with the education that they were working so hard to give us. Soon enough, they started worrying about making payments towards the house and there was a possibility that we might lose it. So they decided another option for us was to move to Costa Rica. 
at that time, we really didn't have a say. They didn't ask us if we wanted to. It was something that they decided. They thought it was the best thing for them to do for us. So when they broke the news on the dining room table, we were very upset. We didn't know any other life but the life that we had here in North Miami. The first thing that crossed my mind was, what about our friends? What about, I was supposed to go to eighth grade next year with, with my close friends. What am I gonna do? Where am I gonna go now? What about our things? At that age, we just couldn't understand it. So we had to start getting rid of our things. Things that we felt were valuable to us. We had to, we basically couldn't really take much with us. So we had to do, you know, yard sales in the front of the house. Basically give away our things. Then I also had to say bye to things that I loved. I had to say bye to my two dogs. Their names were Spencer and Rusty. I had Rusty since he was a puppy. And I didn't know where he would be taken. So the day I knew that my dad was taking him, I had to say goodbye. So I went outside, I gave him a big hug. I played some tricks with him. And I told them that I loved them. And I wondered who would feed him, who would take care of him, who would know how to play the tricks that I knew with him. When my dad took him away, I went back in my room crying and very upset because I didn't understand how they could do this to us. The day before we had to leave, I had to say bye to my best friend, Paulo. He had been my best friend since I was in first grade. My dad dropped me off in the pickup truck and it was already late evening. So I walked out of the truck, went to the porch of his house and I knocked on his door and he came out to see me. And I said, Paulo, you know, you're my best friend. And I love you and I'm gonna miss you. Will you always be my best friend? And I'll try to keep in touch. So I gave him a big hug and I tried not to cry, but I couldn't help myself. As I walked back, to my dad's pickup truck. I went inside the side passenger's door and when I looked at him, I could see that he had seen me say goodbye to my friend. And he was crying. He knew how much I cared about Paulo. In fact, my family cared about him too. He was a very much a part of our family as he was my best friend. So I knew at that moment, it was one of the few times that I've ever seen my dad cry. When we moved to Costa Rica, it was depressing for us. We moved to a much smaller house in a more impoverished neighborhood. The first day we got there, we went to see the house that we were gonna live in and he needed extensive remodeling. My mom's first reaction was to sit on the luggage because there was nowhere else to sit. And she broke down and cried. At that time, my dad hadn't come with us. He stayed behind to work. So it was just me, my brother and my sister and my mom. And when we saw her crying by herself, 
all we could do was go and console her. And we started crying too. My mom has told me since that, that day, the first thing that crossed her mind was, what have we done? She wasn't sure if she made the right decision. But we were already there and we had no other choice. It was very hard for us to understand why they made that decision. We didn't know the language. We knew how to speak basic Spanish, but we didn't know how to read it. We didn't know how to write it. We didn't have any friends. We basically went to an all Spanish school and we had to learn everything that everyone else knew. We had to learn it in a year. And I struggled. My sister struggled. I almost failed my seventh grade class, eighth grade class, sorry. And luckily I had to study over the summer to be able to pass those classes. They were Spanish class, social studies and civics, the hardest classes. And luckily I was able to pass and I was able to move on to, to the next grade level, to ninth grade. But my sister was not so fortunate. She wasn't able to pass and therefore she was stuck a grade behind. We became very rebellious at that age. We gave my mom a really hard time. My dad, he wasn't there all the time. He had to go work and come back. So we were once a unified family and we were broken up. That was very tough for us. My mom was on her own, taking care of these three kids who were giving her a very hard time. It was during this time that I found refuge in a boyfriend. My parents weren't in agreement, but I was already 15, and they felt that they couldn't stop me from having one. So I did, and I felt safe. I felt like a distraction. It was a distraction from all the hard times that we were going through. A year after dating, I was late. And at first I didn't think, I didn't pay too much attention to it. And I thought that it wasn't a big deal. But several weeks passed and I was still late. So I told my boyfriend that I think we should go get a blood exam, blood work exam. So we walked to a clinic a couple blocks down from my house and I got my blood work done. And I went to sit down while we waited and I was extremely nervous because I didn't know what the results were gonna say. And I didn't want to think that being pregnant was a possibility. I couldn't imagine what would happen if, it, if I was, or how disappointing it would be to give that news to my parents. So I clenched my hands real tight and I started praying. I started asking God, please let me not be pregnant. But I was nervous of getting the results. I didn't want people to look at me because I felt that if I, if I read the news, I saw the news that I was pregnant, that I would break down. So when they gave us the envelope, I told my boyfriend, let's go outside and open it outside. 
when they gave me the news, I broke down and cried. I literally fell to my knees. I thought my world had collapsed. What was I gonna do? How was I gonna finish school? How was I gonna tell my parents? I didn't know what to do. Walking home that day was the longest day of my life. I just, I didn't know what decisions to make at that point. But I was too scared to tell my parents. So I tried to conceal it as much as I could. I didn't have the courage to tell them. My dad had come home to spend time with us. And one evening, he told me, hey, Daisy, why don't you walk with me around the block? Let's have a talk. I was like, sure, Dad. I don't think I could, you could tell that I was pregnant, but I had to keep my cool. I didn't want them to know. I was scared of their reaction. I almost felt that if I told them that it was gonna be real, I didn't want to believe it. But as we walked around the block, he told me, Daisy, I heard a rumor. And someone is saying that you're pregnant. Is that true? And at that moment, I couldn't hide it anymore. That was my opportunity to tell him the truth, to tell him the secret that I was keeping, that I was so scared of. And I said, yes, Dad, I'm pregnant. And I could see his immediate disappointment. The same disappointment that I was scared to see. And he said, what are we gonna do? You had plans, you wanted to go to college. You were such a smart kid. You have so much potential. This is gonna change your life. You have to think about what you wanna do. But I will support you either way. So we, as we got around the corner, we were approaching the house. He said, there's one last thing that you have to do. You have to tell your mom and you have to tell her now. I was terrified, but I knew that there was no way out. My mom was gonna know. So I walked into the house with my dad behind me and my dad said, Liliana, your daughter has to tell you something. And she, I believe, already knew. And I told her, Mom, I'm pregnant. And she broke down. She was crying. She was angry. All types of emotions that were stirring there. And she was telling me, Daisy, how could you? How could you do this? You know better. We've talked to you so many times. Why would you do this? Why would you do this to yourself? I didn't have an answer for her. I didn't plan it. It just happened. I told her, I don't know. I don't know why. I told her, but you know, I know abortion is illegal in Costa Rica, but maybe I can go to Miami and I can get an abortion there. 
and everything will be resolved. I'll still be able to go to school the next year. I'll be able to finish high school. I'll be able to go to college. I'll be able to do all the things that I once envisioned for myself. And my mom said, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to be responsible. You're going to be responsible for that baby. Your life is going to change. But you're going to have to do this. At that moment when she said that, I, I was mad. I couldn't understand why, why she would intervene in that way. But I had no choice. I couldn't go to Miami by myself. I didn't have any other option. So breaking the news to my friends and my family members and everyone else was not, was not easy. I got judged by family. Friends stopped talking to me because their parents didn't think I was a good role model. I would hear people say that, oh, Daisy's life is basically over. Like, she's not going to amount to anything. It was a very hurtful time. I was always looked down. It wasn't a joyous moment as when you're an adult and you're looking forward to the baby. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. And I felt that I would never be able to amount to anything. But even then, despite that, I still wanted to prove people wrong. So I had to drop out of high school and study at home to finish my high school diploma. Meanwhile, my sister was having the time of her life. She was in her senior year. She was going out to parties, having fun with our friends. And I was pregnant, studying at home, not being able to enjoy my youth. The day my sister graduated, it was a joyous moment for her, but it was a sad day for me. Because when I saw her go up that podium and get her diploma, I was not up there with her. I was just a guest, sitting down and watching her. And I knew that everybody in that room knew that I was the girl that got pregnant. So that was a very sad moment for me. I would have wanted to be up there and graduate with her. The day that Alyssa was born, it really did change my life. And it changed the life of everyone in my household. It gave everyone a new purpose. My brother and sister became great, a great aunt and uncle to my daughter. And my parents became extended parents to my daughter. The day that she came into this world, the first thing I remember were her big brown eyes. And it also gave me new meaning because I knew that I had to not fight just for me, but I had to fight for her. So shortly after, when my daughter was two years old, I decided 
that it was best for me to move back to Miami. My sister had already moved back and she was already in college and she had a job. And I felt that that was the best place for me to be. That it was the place where I knew I could give her a better future. So I didn't take anything with me. Just my two year old. And we moved back. I had never worked before. So I moved in with my dad and my grandparents. And my grandparents offered to take care of Alyssa while I went to work. I had never had a job, so I started doing temp work. I started making photocopies, answering phones, doing secretarial work. And it was through one of those assignments that a law firm that I started working for wanted to hire me. And they gave me a full-time job as their receptionist. It was there where I learned to work hard and to have good work. Because even if I was just a receptionist, I wanted to be the best receptionist out there. <laughs> so I would work full time and I started school as well. I would work nine to five and then after five, I would rush, get into traffic and take evening classes at FIU. Most of the times I was tired and sometimes my head would be falling off. But I would say Daisy, snap out of it. You need to pay attention because you can't fail these classes. If I fail a class, it's gonna take me that much longer to get my degree. Because I couldn't take full-time classes. I had to take three at a time. So in order not to get overwhelmed, I would say three at a time, three at a time. Every semester, three down. That's how I would take it. Because if I saw all the classes I had to take, I'd be overwhelmed. So sure enough, when I finished my last three, three classes and I was able to graduate, it was a very good day for me. Because not only was I the first person in my household to get a college degree, but I had beat the statistics. It took me about six years to finish when it would typically take someone four. According to CDC statistics, over 50% of teen moms barely get a high school diploma. And when they do, they get it by the age of 22. So here I was getting my college degree. And when I went up that podium with my cap and gown, it made up. It made up for the time where I couldn't be there in high school. And it felt even better because my daughter was actually there seeing me get my degree and applauding for me, her and my parents as well. Now, things got easier when I got the degree. It opened other doors for me, but it was still a struggle. My daughter was growing up and, you know, I still had to manage the work and taking care of her. Fortunately, she found a passion in art, so I was able to help her eventually get into a great magnet school and build a portfolio. And so she's a very talented artist. And I was very proud of that moment for her. And now I also got a chance to work as an architect. And I worked for a boutique for firm for many years. And I'm happy to say now that I work for one of the top real estate development companies in the US. I've been working with them for 10 years. And three years ago, I was promoted to VP of development. 
And that promotion for me was a big reflection of all the hard work, of all the struggles, of being that 10 year old wishing to be an architect. And then now here I was working for this great company, making actual buildings, working with famous architects, traveling the US, and just building amazing projects. Right now, I'm actually completing a 76-story building in Chicago. And it was a recent top-off in February. I managed to be there after completion. So I put my hard hat on, and I got on the elevator hoist. And they asked me if I wanted to go all the way to the top of the building. I said, absolutely. So as I go up that building, I reflect. I reflect on where I started, how my parents struggled, how it was so important for us to go to college, how I managed to get through the pregnancy at 16 and have this little baby come with me on this journey and falling asleep many times at school being able to finally get my college degree. And when I got up that top of the building, it felt amazing. I felt like I was on top of the world. So I share this story with everyone because I want to be able to inspire other young women that are in my situation that it is possible that you can still pursue your dreams and you don't have to choose. You can still do this with your baby. My journey doesn't end here. And I'd like to be able to encourage parents to support their children because without their support, It'll be very difficult to navigate this world alone. Don't turn your kids away. Don't kick them out because they make a mistake. But worrying for my parents and for their support, their encouragement and their love, I'm not sure I would have been able to accomplish all of this without them. And for my daughter, Alyssa, I would like you to come on stage. Alyssa, I want you to know that I'm extremely proud of the young woman that you're becoming. I'm very proud of you being in college. I'm very proud of your, your own individual success. And I want you to know that this story, it wasn't just about me. You're very much part of this journey as I am. You're my companion through all of this. And had you not been here, we wouldn't be here today to tell the story. <laughs> so I want you to know that. I want you to know that we have a special bond and it's just not a mother and daughter bond. It's more than that. We matured together. We grew up together. So you're very much a part of me as I am of you. And I love you. So this is the main reason why I choose life. Thank you.